Next speaker is our invited keynote speaker. I want to invite uh, Professor Scott Schenker on stage here. Scott is a professor at UC Berkeley at computer science. He's also head of the net. Well, come on, Scott. <laughs> uh, the networking uh, president of the International Computer Science Institute at Berkeley. And uh, Scott has been a close ally and partner in, in some of the research work we have been doing over the last few years. He's been um, one part of the um, Clean Slate activities we have done together with Stanford. So this is a combined um, Stanford and, and Berkeley activity. Uh, Ericsson is just now joining a Berkeley um, uh, research program called Amplitudes, no, sorry, Algorithms, Machines, and People which is called AmpLab, and it's relating to cloud computing and crowdsourcing and stuff like that, and where, where Scott is one of the uh, key leading professors. So uh, we are very honored to have you here, Scott. Um, your talk today, I have to check your title again, from Protocols to Abstractions. And uh, well, I think I can have a guess what you will talk about, but I'm excited to see. So. Um, very good. And you're quick. Very well. Welcome, Scott. Then. Thank you. So, whoops, I need to. Um, so, I wanted to apologize to Tian for two reasons. One is uh, I didn't introduce myself when I came in, so when the previous speaker stopped, I saw him panic, run out the room to try and find where his keynote speaker was. Uh, and uh, I, I was already lurking back here. So I let him suffer in silence. The other one is that uh, he had no idea what I was going to talk about when he invited me. And so uh, I, I think once he sees this talk, he'll uh, think twice. So let me start off. So I want to talk about the future of networking and the path to protocols. This is joint work with Martin Casado, Tamu Kaponen, Nick McEwen, and, and many others. These people are familiar to many of you. And what it really is is an attempt to motivate and clarify what I call software-defined networking. I think it's the same you refer to by your split architecture. I'm not sure what the terminology is, but uh, we refer to it as SDN. And my talk is going to start with sort of a Noah's Ark, you know, it's two of everything. I'm going to start with two conundrums, and then two questions, and then two stories, and then two quotes, and then hopefully you'll have had too much by that time. Um, so let's start with an academic paradox or conundrum. So I teach at UC Berkeley. Um, and my colleagues, when they teach operating systems or databases, they teach fundamental principles. They have things like synchronization and mutual exclusion. And then I get up and I teach introductory networking. What do I teach? I teach a bag of protocols. Okay? I have no principles. You know, the end-to-end -end principle is just a vague design guideline, but we have nothing. Then on the practical end of things, you know, computation and storage have been virtualized. They're now very flexible, easy to manage. Not so much with networks. Now, I understand that a fair amount of your profits come from the fact that these are still complex, but, but that doesn't mean we should stop there and, and rejoice in that. Uh, so this talk is going to really address two questions. One is, why are the foundations in networking so weak? I mean, is it just that we're idiots? And that, you know, the people who do databases and operating systems are smarter than we are? That's what my colleagues, that's their explanation. Um, and then how can we make them stronger? So those are the two things. And the answers to both of these questions really lie in the tension between complexity and simplicity. So we all know that networks are becoming increasingly complex. You know, when they were first designed, they were actually quite simple. I mean, you know, Ethernet is an incredibly simple networking design. There's nothing complex about it. And the same thing with IP at its core. It's very complex. I mean, very simple. We have all these new control requirements that have led to the complexity. We have ACLs and VLANs and traffic engineering and middle boxes and deep packet inspection. And that's made what used to be this sort of very elegant design very complex. Now, the infrastructure still works. And that's because people like you are great at mastering the complexity. Now, this ability to master complexity is both a blessing and a curse. 
Because often when you get a system that is extremely complex, what that's telling you is it's built on weak foundations. Now, the complexity is a symptom, not a cause. That is, the, weak, the foundations aren't weak because it's complex. It's complex because the foundations are weak. But the problem is we've gotten great at treating the symptoms, and we sometimes neglect the cause. So I, I want to sort of talk about two stories. One is, so when I was growing up, I had a lot of trouble learning algebra. And my father, you know, I mean, I was, like most of you, reasonably bright, nothing special, but my father was really perplexed by why was I having so much trouble learning algebra. And so he worked with me for a couple of weeks, and he finally turns to me and says, Scott, your problem isn't that you can't learn algebra, it's that you're so good at arithmetic, you don't need it. That when they would give me an algebra problem, I would sort of go and plug in a couple of numbers and figure out what the answer was, and then come out and solve it by guessing. So I was... I used my skill at mastering the complexity of arithmetic to avoid learning algebra. And once he pointed that out to me, you know, I was able to learn it. And then let me tell another story. I spent the first 15 years of my research life at Xerox Park. And at the time I joined, which was the early to mid-80s, it was the mecca for user interface design. I mean, it was a decade ahead of everybody else in the world. And Don Norman, who was one of the user interface designers that you know, became famous at Apple, came to, to give a colloquium. And so he walks in, and, and you know, the, the, the auditorium was packed. And, and at that point, Xerox Park was heavily male, so it was packed with all these males. And so Don Norman sort of ambles up to the stage and you know, takes his time, and he looks out at the audience, and he says, how many of you drive a stick shift? So we sort of look at each other, and then, you know, and then most of it, well, I didn't raise my hand. I don't drive a stick shift, but, you know, almost everybody else did, and they were very proud. It was like, I drive a stick shift. I'm a man. And, and he sort of looks at us. He just calmly scans the audience. He says, none of you should ever design a user interface. <laughs> and so there are two morals to this story. One is that the ability to master complexity, the ability to drive a stick shift, is very different than the ability to extract simplicity. And that if you dr like driving a stick shift, then you're drawn to mastering complexity. But designing user interface is all about extracting simplicity, and they're two very different tasks. And the other point that he made is we should put a lot more effort into this than into mastering complexity. When you master complexity, you have to do it for every single problem. When you extract simplicity, that's much longer lasting. So where has simplicity triumphed? You know, where it's an example where we've successfully extracted simplicity out of a, a place where things used to be very complex. So most people would say programming is, is one of our best examples in computer science. So how did programming become simple? So we started with machine languages, had no abstractions, you had to deal with all the low-level details. Then you had higher-level languages, and they used a lot of useful abstractions, file systems, virtual memory, abstract data types. And then we have the modern languages that have object orientation and garbage collection and so forth. And the lesson was that abstractions are the way we extracted simplicity in this case. That by defining these abstractions that we could use, then our task became simpler and simpler. So, so why are these abstractions useful? So interfaces are really just instantiations of abstractions. So why are abstractions or interfaces useful? Well, it's obvious, I mean, you all use them, that they shield you from low-level details, right? You allow freedom of implementation on both sides. If you have a clean interface, then how you implement this module is independent of how you implement this one. So you can define a modular programming structure. Now, how many people here have seen Barbara Liskoff's talk on the power of abstraction? She gave a Turing Award lecture on this. If not, go, go watch it. It, it. You know, there are 18 versions on YouTube. It's really a very deep, lecture. I mean, it's something that, that really inspired me. It stayed with me. Um, but the key point she makes is that interfaces, they don't remove complexity. They merely hide it. That is, somebody deals with the complexity once, and then everybody else gets to leverage that work. So it's not like you've, you know, somehow you've magically made complexity disappear. You've just been able to encapsulate it and let everybody else use that work. And so what Barbara Liskoff says in her talk is, Modularity based on abstraction is the way things get done. You know, this is why we can have programs that have 10, 000, 10 million lines of code. 
So if you talk about the right way to overcome complexity, if you thought networks were complex, 10 million lines of code, making that simple, that's a real success story. Now the other thing she said is that abstraction is at the center of much work in computer science. So this is something that most areas in computer science focus on. Not so much networking. So where do we talk about abstractions and networking? So one area where we talk about are layers. Layers are the, you know, one place where we talk about uh, abstractions. So layers provide this very nice data plane service abstraction, right? We have, you know, best effort delivery. We then have a reliable byte stream. These are great ways to think about what's going, you know, without worrying about the, the mechanisms underneath, you have this abstraction of what the network is doing for you. These are great. These are terrific abstractions. I'm going to get back to it, but as an aside, as interfaces, they suck. These are awful. If my grad student designed an interface like this, I'd flunk them. I mean, these are, they violate the basic principle of modularity, which is you hide the implementation details. And the fact that IP addresses go through the architecture, duh, idiotic, right? Nobody would build a system that way. Now, I'm not criticizing people who invented this. They were just making things work. But if we were to look at the interfaces now as system design decisions, they're terrible. They're terrible interfaces. But that's just an aside. I'll get back to that later. But my main point here is, while we have good data plane abstractions, we really don't have good control plane abstractions. There's no sort of sophisticated management building blocks. So every time we have a new control requirement, we have to add complexity to the system because we have to invent something new. We don't have a building block that we can build upon. So what we need to do is reverse this trend towards complexity in networks. And so we need to simplify networking control rather than just mastering the complexity. It's harder to do, but it's much longer lasting. And so to break this bad habit of continually adding complexity to the network, we need to understand why we're doing it, where this is coming from. So how do we solve problems today, and what are the requirements for those solutions? So the, the, how we solve problems today, you know, we can either define a new protocol, or we can ad hoc mechanism, or we can leave it to the you know, operators. doesn't really matter which, which of these we pick. The key is, what are the requirements for those solutions? And there are three requirements. <clears throat> One is they have to operate within the confines of a given data path. You know, you're handed IP or MPLS or whatever your data path is, but you're given a data path, and you've got to live with whatever it can and cannot do. Second, you have to live without communication guarantees. So you've got a general distributed system, arbitrary delays, arbitrary drops. That's yours to deal with. And lastly, your solution has to compute the configuration of every single physical design device in the network, whether it's ACLs or FIBs or whatever it is, that's what you've got to end up computing. So you've got to operate within a constraints of a data path, you've got to deal without communication guarantees, and you've got to actually provide a detailed configuration for every device. So I've got a secret for you. This is insanity. This is completely crazy. So let's say somebody came to you and said, you've got to program your computer. And to do so, you've got to specify where every bit is stored. You've got to deal with all internal communication errors, meaning if you do a store and it fails, that's your problem. Deal with it. And you've got to do it with a, with a programming language that doesn't have much expressibility. What would your response be? You wouldn't say, oh, yeah, sure, I'll go do that. You would say, forget it. And you would say, OK, well, first I'm going to define a higher level of abstraction for memory, right? So I don't have to deal with that problem. And then I'm going to deal, devise some reliable communication primitives so I don't have to deal with that problem. And then I'm going to define a new programming language that gives me my expressibility. So why have we in networking just sort of said, OK, fine, we'll go do this? Whereas in every other discipline in computer science, they said, forget it. We're going to define some abstractions first and get those right, and then we'll go solve the problem. So what we do here is we've separated the problem into manageable pieces. We haven't done that in networking at least not on the control plane. So what we need to do is define some abstractions to help us simplify how we think about control tasks. And so the three concerns that I listed are this constrained forwarding model, distributed state, and detailed configuration. Now, the way 
we define these abstractions, the way we separate these concerns, are going to define the fundamental abstractions of networking. Okay? So these are important decisions to make, because this is what all networks will be built around. Now, I just want to point out, we're not talking about new mechanisms. We have all the mechanisms we're ever going to need. Okay? We just have never developed the right abstractions. And the difference between mastering complexity and abstracting simplicity is whether or not you focus on finding the right abstraction versus defining a new mechanism. And so that's the habit we need to break ourselves of, is that when you're faced with a new design problem, you figure out what was the right abstraction rather than going and proving that you're smart by building a protocol that solves your problem. So we now need abstractions for these forwarding, distributed state, and detailed configuration. So let's go through those one by one. So let's abstract the forwarding model. So if you're trying to control the network, you need some kind of flexible forwarding model so that the control program can specify what happens rather than dealing with some limitation of what your underlying uh, forwarding protocol does. So it shields the upper layers from exactly how you do the forwarding. And the point is it doesn't really matter what you pick. You could say the way we're going to do forwarding is you hand me a general x86 program, and I'll run it, and it'll schedule the packets, and we use, you know, the route bricks design from Intel that, you know, it's only about a tenth as fast as, as forwarding chips, but completely general. Or MPLS, or OpenFlow, doesn't really matter, but let's pick one. Let's pick a clean abstraction for how we do forwarding, and then we don't have to worry about it anymore. What about state distribution? So the control program should not have to deal with the vagaries of distributed state. This is really complicated stuff. It's the source of many errors. The number of people who know how to build really solid distributed systems are about 10. You know, if you look at Google has dozens of complicated distributed systems. Jeff Dean has basically designed all of them. You know, the, there are not many people who really get this stuff right. So it's really hard. So we should do it once and let everybody else leverage it rather than having your control program have to deal with it. So, the, you know, the phrase network operating system, that, that's something that we use, is an example of this, which what it says is, we're going to provide you with an abstraction, which is we'll give you a global view of the network. And that's what you deal with. You don't have to deal with the, the physical reality. We'll give you a logical view of the network. And so I'm going to show a picture of this in a second, but the point is the control program will then operate on this network view, which is essentially a graph. And so given the graph as input, you then figure out what the configuration should be of every device. So if you take these two abstractions, you end up with a picture like this. So the current networks look like this. You've got protocols in between switches. You throw them out. You then define a network operating system that runs on servers in the network. You control the switches via this forwarding interface, and this network operating system provides this global network view. And then if you're writing a control program, it's on top of this network view. You write a control program on top of a graph. You forget about the fact it's distributed. That's what the network operating system does, that it takes configuration from here and, and configures the switches, and then it takes state from the switches and puts it into the network view. Your control program has no idea the network is distributed. So you're running Dijkstra, not Bellman Ford. Okay? You're just writing a program on a graph. So this is a huge change in the paradigm. Because we're not designing control protocols. We're designing a control function. What I mean by that is the configuration you want is some function of the view. You're not figuring out how to get the view. You're just saying, whatever the view is, here's what the answer is. It's just a function. So why is this an advance? It's much easier to write. It's much easier to check. It's much easier to reason about. Because it's just, it's just like writing a program over a graph. And the network operating system handles all of the state dissemination and collection. So this abstraction bites off distribution as a tractable piece and solves it and then lets the rest of the control, problem, control program ignore it. <coughs> so you might say, well, what, what about consistency? I mean, it really is a distributed system. You haven't changed that. But notice, you design your network operating system so that it's eventually consistent. That is, the view will eventually reflect 
the reality of the network. That's not hard. We know how to do that. And then notice that as long as this is true, then you will eventually end up with the right configuration of your network because your view will converge towards reality. And at every step, you're saying my configuration is just a function of the view. When my view gets real, my configuration is correct. That's the correctness proof. That's a lot easier than looking at a distributed protocol and trying to figure out whether it's actually going to converge to the right answer. So what about transient conditions? Because it, it does take you a while to converge. So it's very hard in a distributed protocol to figure out, let's say, are there going to be loops while this is converging? Here it's actually quite easy. If at every time you have a picture of the network and you say that the function from the view never creates a loop, then you will never have loops. End of story. And you say, well, hold it. You know, you, you've got to distribute the controller. The controller is not a single computer. It's actually distributed. Well, actually, if you sensibly break up the way the, the problem is distributed among controllers, like every controller handles you know, an end-to-end -end path. The end-to-end -end path is not handled by two separate controllers, but by a single controller, and you split those up, then you can enforce the no-loop condition very easily. So this is a much easier way to enforce correctness conditions on a very complicated distributed problem by breaking it apart. So now why does this scale? This is a question we always get that, you know, okay, you've got this big complicated network and all of a sudden you're saying that I'm going to give you a central view, it can't possibly scale. But actually consistency is the reason why it scales. Down at the fast time scales of per packet, you don't need any consistency. Packets go independently. At the per flow scale, again, you don't need any consistency. Every flow can be handled individually. Network events, meaning switches coming and going, links coming and going. Here you need eventual consistency. You don't need transactional consistency, just eventual consistency. You can build a scalable system that, that's eventually consistent, as big as you want. The only place you need strong consistency is essentially where you implement your control program. That is, everybody needs to agree on what the control program is. That happens on human time scales. You know, maximum 10 per second, something like that easily can build a transactional system that can handle that rate of change without breathing hard. So there's no scaling problem here whatsoever. So the scaling is straightforward. So you might say, well, okay, well, what about OpenFlow? Isn't that what everybody's talking about? Well, the network operating system conveys the configuration of the global network view. Remember, I, I took a global network view, and then I, my control program decide what the configuration I want, and the network operating system would then take it down to the physical switches. Nothing in that statement tells me what configuration means. It just says whatever state you want that switch to have, your control program decides it, and then it gets handed down to it. OpenFlow is, is, is one possible solution to that. It's clearly not the right solution. I mean, it, it's probably a very good solution for now, but it's not, there's nothing that says this is fundamentally the right answer. Open, think of OpenFlow as the x86 instruction set. Is the x86 six instruction set correct? Is it the right answer? No, it's good enough for what we use it, so for why bother changing it? That's what OpenFlow is. It's the instruction set that we happen to use, but we shouldn't get hung up on it being exactly right. So let's think about what the fundamental principles are of software-defined networking. The core principle is that the configuration flows from the global view. That is, you look at the global view, you figure out what you, how you want the network configured, and then you instantiate that configuration. You have lots of performance issues. For instance, every time the network changes, you can't wait to go for the view to change and then the controller to come back and instantiate new state to respond to it. So you need to do things like configure backup paths or other local, you know, other sort of local programs that would respond to local state and change. And the only point here is that doesn't violate SDN at all. And when you hear people talk about SDN, often other academics at least, they say, well, you know, SDN doesn't work because what happens if I need a backup path? That's just a different way of configuring it. It's just part of configuration. It doesn't change anything about SDN. So for instance, here would be a completely consistent SDN implementation. 
that, you know, the forwarding model that you have on the line cards is you have open flow plus the fully general forwarding model, you know, an x86 or maybe you want to use a GPU to be more efficient, but you have a fully general forwarding model. Your switch, how you configure a switch is you hand it a Java program, an arbitrary Java program. So if you want to say, if this link fails, do this, and if that link fails, do that, fine, you just hand off a, a program. And then the network operating system has this distributed state model that's essentially a key value store with a little bit of constraints on the data model to sort of, so you can make sure that you don't get intrinsic inconsistencies on how you're expressing state. I'm not advocating that this is something we should move towards now, but the point is this is a completely consistent with everything I've been saying about this being a viable way to implement software-defined networking. And it has the nice feature that you can start off with features in software and then migrate them to hardware. And, you know, right now, the, the sort of the x86 forwarding, you know, an order of magnitude slower than hardware. So if 10% of your traffic or less are using this new feature, you're fine. So new features start in software. Small fraction of your traffic is using them, and then they'll gravitate over to hardware if it proves to be valuable. Perfectly viable approach. So are we done? Is, is this, you know, I mean, am I going to leave, you know, with a half hour left of my time? I'm an academic, of course not, you know. Um, so this approach is not done because it requires the control program or the operator to configure each individual network device. And that's way more complicated than it should be. So the network operating system eases the implementation of functionality by it says, okay, you tell me how you want to configure the network and I'll go do it for you. But it doesn't ease the specification of functionality. You still need to decide on what the fib is and what the ACLs are and every single switch in the network. Okay? That's way too complicated. So how can we provide abstractions that are more meaningful to operators and to control programs? Well, it's by offering an abstraction. So what you want to do is give control programs an abstract view of the network. You don't want to show them the full network. You want to give them an abstract view of the network. And then the control program takes that abstract view and it configures that abstract view. And you want the model to provide just enough detail so that I can express my goals without providing me all the information I would need to implement those goals. I, I don't want to implement. If I'm the operator, I don't want to implement them. I just want to specify them. So here's an example. Let's say we want to do access control. And here's the full network view. And these blue lines are sort of the external access links. And then the, the black lines are in, internal links. So is that what I want to show an operator? Of course not. What I want to show an operator if they're talking about access control is this. It says, you know, can this guy talk to this guy? Yes or no? That's all that ought, ought to be specified. The internal structure of the network the operator doesn't need to see that at all. This is how you implement the ACLs, but you want to specify it on the simplest network model possible. In that case, it's just a single crossbar. That's plenty to implement, to, to specify what kind of access controls you want. So a more detailed model would be to say the service model for the network is a series of table lookups that you might want to do a lookup at layer two, and then you want to do a lookup at layer three, and then maybe you want to apply some ACLs, and maybe you look up at some other table. <clears throat> but it's really a series of table lookups. I mean, globally, I don't mean within a single switch, meaning that's what you want your network to do, is sort of go look at the packet, look it up, and do a couple of lookups. For instance, here, if you were just worried about access control, you would just do an ACL lookup, which says, you're coming in on this input port, are you allowed to go out on that output port or not? Yes or no? So if that's the way you specify what you want your network to do, what you do is you create these table pipelines in virtual space. On, you know, this is your abstract network. And then you figure out how to actually implement these table lookups on the physical hardware you have. So this is sort of, think of this as one logical switch in logical space. You might have 100 physical switches. You just need to make sure you want to make sure each one of these lookups happens. It doesn't have to happen on every switch. Just make sure it happens somewhere. So who maps this abstract view to the, the physical view? So we're going to define something called a network hypervisor. 
I have come up with the worst piece of terminology in the world, a hypervisor. But when I call it a hypervisor, everybody gets very confused and says, "Isn't that what VMware sells?" So, it's a network hypervisor, and it's a hypervisor because it's a layer between this abstract model and the network operating system. So this is the picture I used to show you, and now what we do is we jack up the control program, and we stick in this network hypervisor. And what it does is it provides this abstract network view. And so I write a control program to configure, let's say, this pipeline of, of table lookups. And so I say, okay, you know, here, here's how you populate those abstract tables. The hypervisor then says, okay, now I know what lookups I have to do. I see the view of the entire network. I will figure out where those lookups ought to happen, and I will instantiate the correct state in those physical switches to make sure this happens. And then the network operating system goes down and instantiates that in real switches. Okay? That's how it works. So basically what I'm calling for are three basic network interfaces. There's a forwarding interface that provides a flexible abstract forwarding model. There's a global network view that shields the higher layers from state dissemination and collection. You don't have to worry about it. I'm just going to give you a graph. And then there's this abstract network view that shields the control program from details of the physical network. And so I claim that for control programs, these are the three abstractions, not a three abstractions, the three abstractions we will need. End of story. So that, in terms of motivating software-defined networking or the split architecture, we've all talked about it as a mechanism, and isn't it great? The point is, this is how we arrived at it by thinking about what abstractions you need. So let's go from software-defined networking to sort of clean slate architectures, because this is where I spend most of my academic life, is thinking about if we were to redesign the internet, how would we design it? And so, you know, what I've talked about today are the basic abstractions that would underlie software-defined networking. And then but what are the abstractions that might be relevant to the overall architecture, not just to network control? What about more general architectural questions besides network control? So one problem you would like to solve, something that everybody says, is the current Internet architecture is very rigid. It's very hard to change. Going from IP to IPv6 has been a decade-long struggle, and that's a pretty mild change. That it's very hard to change things. And so why is that? And can we fix that problem? And so the question is, how can we make the architecture evolvable? How can we design an internet architecture that's evolvable? And I've heard people talking about that for 15 years. And I've never heard a good solution proposed. I'm going to propose one in two slides. So first, let's talk about why the architecture is rigid. So IP is the central component of the architecture. IP is embedded in interdomain routing. Interdomain routing is hard to change because all the domains have had to agree on it. IP is embedded in applications via the API. It's hard to change all applications. So we're stuck. It's really hard to get rid of IP. So pictorially, it looks like this. I find this diagram actually a very useful way to think about Internet architectures, not just by drawing a bunch of domains, but actually looking at this sort of bird's eye view. You start with an application. It interacts with the network stack which interacts with the domain, which interacts with the rest of the networking. Have you seen those sort of the New Yorker covers where they show New York City and then, you know, it sort of goes to the rest of New York and then, you know, sort of California is that little speck off in the distance? Well, this is sort of the New Yorker view of Internet architecture that starts with the application being the center of the world and the rest of the Internet being sort of like California. So we have two fundamental standards, IP and BGP. IP is embedded in applications, it's embedded in BGP, and we end up with a very rigid architecture. So now, as an alternative, let's insert two architectural abstractions. One, let's put in a clean interdomain routing interface. Okay? There's no leakage of what happens inside a domain. The way you define interdomain routing, you don't refer to anything that happens inside a domain, and particularly you don't refer to the addressing inside the domain. You just route on domain names. 
and you make sure that it, it can do flexible route computation. It's not like BGP that sort of bakes the route computation into the protocol itself. And then we define a clean network API that you, there's no leakage of the network architecture into the application. Why does the architecture need, why does the application need to know about how you do addressing? It ought to be dealing with names, right? And you just make sure it has flexible interface semantics so you can do pub sub or whatever else you want. It's not limited to socket. And I claim, if you do this, the architecture is evolvable. You're done. You're done. So let me show you a picture. This is the picture we had before. So we get rid of BGP and we put an extensible and ab abstract interface. Extensible in that you can add functionality, abstract in that it doesn't show the details of the implementation, it doesn't leak the network information into interdomain routing. And so now IP is no longer embedded in interdomain routing. You replace the network API with something that's extensible and abstract. IP is no longer embedded in the applications. And now you have complete freedom to change what goes on in here. Now I know this sounds, you know, like, you know, sort of typical academic voodoo, but it's not. I mean, right now, we can change L2, right? Domains can do whatever they want in L2. All this does is it means everything that happens between the application and interdomain routing is L2. Why, can't, why can we change L2 and not L3? It's because L3 shows up in applications. L2 doesn't. This just means everything is like L2. We've had no trouble in evolving L2 technologies. All this says is we're going to have the same freedom if we did this. So the point of this aside was not, well, it was to, just because I'm really proud of this work and I wanted to advertise it, but more importantly, it's to show that this is the power of abstraction, that you take a problem that lots of people have thought about for a long time, and rather than thinking about what's the mechanism that might let me do this, just say, what are the abstractions that I need? And once you figure out the right abstractions, often you don't have to invent anything else. Extensible and abstract interfaces, that's not a new idea. Right? This is just old stuff. But just recognizing where to put those abstractions changes the problem. But the main focus here was how, on how to build networks, not redefining the internet architecture. So I want to go back and make a few comments about abstractions before I end my talk. So you know, abstractions are not academic playthings. This is not just what we write textbooks about, but people who build real networks can ignore them. This completely changes where we focus our attention when we build networks. It enables much greater functionality with lower effort, and in particular, no more designing distributed control protocols. We're done. Inside a domain. Interdomain routing, we're stuck with BGP, but out inside a domain, no more distributed control protocols. That's done. Once you define a network operating system, nothing else needs to be distributed. So now, your whole task is to define control programs over this abstract model. And that really is just asking yourself the question, if this is the network I have, what do I want to have happen? You just write that function. That's all about what you want to have happen, now, not how it happens. And that's the easiest part of the networking, is to figure out what you want to have happen, not how to make it happen. And so the infrastructure is now in three very tractable separate pieces. It's building the network hypervisor, which, which is hard, but it's tractable. The network operating system, again, that's not a simple task, but it's tractable. And then building forwarding elements that support whatever your forwarding model is. We can do those three things, you know, because we're only solving one problem at a time. We're not solving all three problems at a time. So the main point of the talk is that software-defined networking or split architecture, it's not just a better mechanism. It's an instantiation of the fundamental abstractions. That's why it's right, not because it beats out some other mechanism but according to some metric, but it captures the right abstractions. These abstractions were needed to separate the concerns that we had of the, the separate problems we needed to solve, and that the abstractions are fundamental, the implementations are ephemeral. We talk about OpenFlow and Onyx and particular instantiations. I hope 10 years from now we're on to something else. By God, I hope we've got something better, right? But the abstractions are probably going to remain the same. So this is both familiar and radical. There, we really didn't need any new mechanisms. If we replaced OpenFlow with MPLS, we would be almost as happy. 
but it's radically modular. You get all the benefits of modular programming, so we can reliably build much more complicated functionality than we could before. So our task ahead is really to, to build these three separable pieces and then worry about how to build control programs over these abstract models. That is, for the problem you're considering, what is the right abstract model, and then how do you build the hypervisor that can translate that abstract model into to a real physical network? That's where the challenge lies. So in conclusion, you know, the future of networking lies in cleaner abstractions, not in defining complicated distributed protocols. It took operating systems researchers a while to figure this out. First they made it work, then they made it simple. We've now made networks work. And it's our turn to make networking a mature discipline by figuring out how to extract simplicity from the sea of complexity that we're currently in. With that, thank you, and questions. Mark them again. Yeah, yeah. Very, very interesting. Course, by the way. But, but yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Two questions. Okay. First of all, to me, it sounds like it's more of a stick shift problem. And what I mean by that is that people want this to be complex and not simple. Because if it's simple, anyone else can do it. And I was, was just wondering uh, what's your take on that. And the second question is really how long. So, so let me, um, and the, your first question, it, so there the really are two separate debates. One is, do users actually want a simple interface? And, and actually, Don Norman has said, the evidence is in, and the answer is no. You know, if you give me a simple cell phone and a complicated cell phone, I'll think this complicated cell phone's got additional features, I'm going to buy it. I mean, it's just time and time again. But... Do people who build these things, do they want simpler abstractions so they can build the fancy features without having to do it? They want the simplicity. But, but the end customers, while they say they want simplicity, they never want to be left without a feature. But, but the way you sort of architect the, the network, you want it to be simpler so you can build. I mean, we, we write modular programs. And that obviously has been successful because it lets us build complexity while not having to deal with complex features without having to deal with complexity all the way through. Um, so your second question is, how long can we go with the, the current framework? And ask that question to the people in the room. I have no idea. <laughs> Did it, it, was it? Oh, James was done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was great to talk about. Um, the one thing, though, that I, I, I disturbed me a little bit is, is um, it seems like, uh, like the academics have given up on BTP, and that, that I find really a problem, because basically um, BTP is a mixture of uh, the fundamental mechanism doing the interdomain rock control and a piece involving policy assertion across domains. And that piece is a complex piece because it's only as complicated as getting the actual mechanism of the network to work. But it's why? Because and there have been many studies, I mean Ben Rexford has done some, on how that people can cheat on, on, on policy assertions. And I think that I would like the software defined networking community to think about this problem a little more and not just give up and say, oh, BDP is going to be make make BDP into a brand name. So whatever comes out under Dexgen BDP is still BDP, but it actually has these principles that you describe here in interdomain routing. So, so let, let me respond to that. I just came from the SIGCOM program committee. I can guarantee you we have not given up on BGP. The number of papers on BGP, it, it's still exponentially expanding. So there's, been a there's still a tremendous amount of attention paid to it. I, I think you, you make an incredibly important point, which is to separate the policy model from the instantiation that is currently BGP and sort of figure out, you know, how, how to make this work. And I think actually a lot of people, Jen Rexford, Michael Shapira, and uh, Sharon Goldberg, there, there's a whole crowd that are really trying to think deeply about this. There are other people who are thinking, you know, uh, my former student Brighton Godfrey is thinking about something called pathlets that actually is a different way of having the same kind of policy flexibility but allowing much more flexible route computation. And so it, it's, a, you know, it, it's a different model, but it's got the same kind of policy independence that you would want. And I think there's an interesting dialogue about uh, 
how we might get from one to the other. And for instance, I, I think the Pathlet model is actually a good bilateral model. You could actually start with that bilaterally. But I think there's an interesting debate to be had about what's the fundamental abstraction you want for interdomain routing to start building on rather than there have been a series of papers, well, BGP's got this problem, and if you tweak this parameter and you do this to it and you take a hammer and go like that, then all of a sudden it behaves a little differently. That, I, I, you know, sort of isn't getting us anywhere fast. I mean, the, the flow of information being too much or, or, or not being guaranteed? Uh, the flow of information being too much, such, such that the, the finite time to produce convergence for critical classes of events can, can be extenuated because basically all classes of information seem to have, have sort of the same priority. <coughs> that I can't separate out the resiliency part from the higher level programming network operation, network operating well, uh, so, so I, I think that, that was getting to the, the, this comment about how I want to configure it. So, yes, when, when the network changes, I send that state up. But I can always configure a low-level response, like backup paths, that say, when some event happens, do this so you can preserve connectivity in the short term while I figure out what to do in the long term. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why you want to look at the network view and calculate how should these backup paths be constructed so that they don't interfere. And they're actually, I mean, people are working on this to, you know, so that, that you can actually make rational decisions that if a bunch of people do things independently, you still don't get into trouble. Okay. But, 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 I mean, that, but, but that's absolutely a problem. I don't think we make it any worse, but we don't magically solve it either. Uh, I, oh, I'm sorry? I, I think we want to talk first. Yeah, okay, you great. can continue after. Well, let's see, uh, Joel here. Joel. Um, if I've understood you right, and it was an interesting talk, part of what you said that was particularly powerful is that at an abstraction level, you want to separate the abstraction for talking about forwarding from the abstraction for talking about network control. Forgetting how you represent those, that forgetting what machines they're on or anything else, that you want to talk about them as separate abstractions. That's very powerful. And if I look back at some of the history of programming and operating systems, I can see where similar things happen. But there's a step that I think maybe you slid past because it's uh, complicated, but I want to ask you to look at it for a minute. If we're going to do that, we have to have abstractions to talk about those things, to talk about what the pieces, the elements of forwarding are, to talk about what the components of, con of control processing are. At the moment, we have a couple of candidates for forwarding uh, longest prefix match, which is clearly wrong. Maybe flows, that is, it seems to be too detailed, specific. Maybe something else that I don't know what. We don't seem to be talking about what is the right abstraction for forward. And when we get to network control, we tend to talk about it in terms of Cisco CLI, because that's what everybody uses, which is clearly completely <laughs> the wrong abstraction for talking about <laughs> No. <laughs> I, know. I mean, I mean, it, I mean when, when I listened to Barbara Liskoff's talk, what, what struck me was she groped her way to what she finally put forward as the right abstraction, but the reasoning process behind it was not pretty or, or linear, and I, I don't think we're going to do any better. Um, I mean, I... I I, w I wish I had a better answer, but I think it's sort of, you know, you 
you know, that, you, you know you have an interface right when people, the, the level of complaints go down. But, but you know, that, that, that's the proof of correctness. <laughs> Okay, so I was hoping that boulder was going to stay under the rug, but um, right. So the the story I gave was you have state uh, the view, and you decide on a configuration. Now, that's a very clean story because you have no history dependence whatsoever. Clearly, if you have rapidly changing state, you want to put some damping in the response so that you are not sort of you know every time this changes you do that. And you know the, the 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 global equivalent of rot flap damping, but but something where you sort of have you don't have this knee jerk connection between a change in state and a change in configuration, so you can hopefully reduce the amount of the the number of configuration changes. It's not linear because for optical network, for example, using optical wavelength, is not linear. It's completely nonlinear because you might have all these optical uh, impairments. We're changing from one path to another. That's the issue. So it's very, you know, it's very to uh, compass some paths to generate a new path or a new, uh, let's say, secondary path for, for the main path. No, no. So, so I think I'm agreeing with you, which, which is you don't want to have this kind of every time there's any change, you completely recompute. You want to think carefully about the frequent or the common state changes and sort of figure out what kind of changes you want to instantiate. So whether that means that you figure out what's in, uh, sort of a, a non-optimal but incremental update when something happens. And I think that's going to be technology specific. And so I, I think optical in particular would, would, is going to require its own sort of change there. Ah, so um, let, let me start with the second question, that the convergent properties of doing routing this way are really no worse. Think, the, what I described is essentially OSPF. You know, you get the state, you bring it up, you look at a graph, and you push it down. But it's OSPF where the distribution model is under your control rather than the distribution going to every switch. You sort of go to a replicated set of controllers, and they push it back out. So I don't think the convergence gets any worse than you know, OSPF convergence, which, you know, for better or worse, but, but we're familiar with it. Um, the flexible route computation, there, I mean, I, I have in mind a very specific, I, I, the, this pathlet design has a very specific notion of it. I'm not saying that that's, that this is an example of what it might mean, which is the way you specify policies there is rather than getting in a route and sort of computing it and only advertising certain routes, you advertise policy compliant route fragments. You say, this is a, 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 a path fragment that I'm willing to support. And if I only have nearest neighbor policies, that, that's easy. If I have complicated policies, it, it's longer. Once you have that, any end system can take a bunch of these pathlets and construct them any way they want to, and they are guaranteed to have a policy compliant path. And so that's a way of having policy compliant source routing in a, in a very scalable way. That's a particular instantiation of it, but, that, but, but the, the goal is to say, if you don't have flexible route computation, then you don't have an extensible interdomain routing interface, and then you're probably going to have to change the interface. And so that the need for flexible route computation comes from saying, 
We want to be able to define this abstraction once and leave it there, and if it's not flexible, then we know we're going to have to change it, and that's really hard. So, so I mean, so I'm not claiming that the mechanism is the right mechanism. I'm saying that the need is, is sort of fundamental. One more question. So, so I, I would say, so the, the, the two separate pieces of my talk, there were the, the bulk of it was about software-defined networking, and I would say that's pretty orthogonal to IPv6, that the, the, the kinds of control mechanisms that we're talking about, IPv6 is, you know, sort of, it, its advantages and disadvantages are rather orthogonal. The Internet architecture stuff I talked about, IPv6 would become another L2 technology. Meaning you're not using, in that design, you're using domain names as interdomain addressing and IP addresses as internal addressing. And so I, my domain can use IPv6, your domain can use IPv17, and we don't care, just like with L2 addresses. I have a question as well before I let you go. Yeah, sure. um, so software-defined networking, as, I mean, assuming that you can solve all these uh, abstractions and all these interfaces and have a problem with that, it seemed to be very t um, attractive for data centers. I mean, that's the players yeah. that are. And I guess one reason is that they, they can build their network from scratch and then turn it on, uh, whereas we live in a world where we have to sort of inject this slowly somehow. Right. So how can we have this work? How do we inject SDN in existing networks if it at all? That's a really good question. I don't know. I, I mean, I, 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 it would be great to discuss it with you guys, but I mean, how, how you would do that incrementally within a very large mm -hmm. wham? I don't know. All right. Well, that's good. Let's have some questions that the professor doesn't have answers to. <laughs> Thank you very much, Scott. I think uh, another hand for Scott. <laughs> Excellent speech. Thank you very much.